Panorama TV presents How They Do That, where we explore the world of professional photographers and share their techniques with you. Here's your host, Mark Wallace. Hi everybody, welcome to this week's episode of How They Do That. Well, today on the show we have Simon Stafford. He's a professional photographer based in the United Kingdom. He's been shooting for over 30 years as a wildlife and portrait photographer, and he wrote the Nikon Compendium as well as 15 books about the Nikon camera system for the Magic Lantern Guide series. He's the technical editor for Nikon Owner Magazine and a regular contributor to many other photography magazines. So welcome to the show, Simon. Hi, Mark. Thank you very much indeed. It's good to be aboard. Well, it's so good to have you here. So can you, for those viewers that don't know uh, about your work, can you tell us a little bit about what you shoot and how you work? These days, uh, principally, my interests are wildlife photography, travel photography, uh, and some landscape photography. Although it wasn't always that way. Uh, I actually started out as a sports photographer more years ago than I care to remember now. But uh, that's what I do these days. Well, that, that is really interesting. In fact, we, we've uh, talked to several sports photographers that are doing uh, work and they tell us how they can take the, the uh, things they learn for sports photography and apply them to either photojournalism or in your case about shooting uh, animals out in you know, nature. So do you find that that background helped you shoot um, your animals? Very much so. Um, of course, in my days of shooting sports photography, uh, it was long before uh, digital. Uh, in fact, it was long before autofocus. So uh, manual focusing skills honed in those days have thankfully stayed with me, although they're a little rusty. Um, but yes, a lot of the techniques are still apply to, to many subjects. Anticipation of the subject is one of the most important. Well, let's talk about some of the shots that I think are uh, some of my favorites that you've taken. And those are the wolves that you shot in Bavaria. I just think these are exceptional shots. So can you tell us a little bit about how you shot those what lenses you used, how you found the wolves. Just tell us the whole story. Well, uh, patience comes to mind. Um, I'd been there for some five days and the weather had closed in on the first three days to the point that it was snowing. We had lots of fog. Um, there was nothing to be seen. You literally couldn't see beyond the end of the, the camera lens. So um, I guess that's one of the watchwords for, uh, for wildlife photography is you just have to be patient and wait for the light. Um, after five days, we were lucky and we had the break in the light. Uh, it was early morning, uh, we were up long before uh, sunrise to get into position. Obviously the days where we couldn't shoot, we'd spent time scouting and we'd worked out uh, potential areas for, for shooting and it was just then a question of waiting for that light. And tell us a little bit about the, I mean, how close were you to the, the wolves and um, how long were the lenses that you used to, to shoot them? Uh, my principal lens for most wildlife photography these days is the, the Nikkor 200 to 400 millimeter zoom. And it was that lens that I used for all of those uh, pictures taken in Bavaria on that morning. Um, I guess I was about uh, 30 to 40 meters away, so 30 to 40 yards. Um, sometimes a little bit closer, sometimes a little further away. Uh, I was in a fixed position, I, I couldn't move. Um, we were in a sort of uh, a blind um, and it was just a question of then waiting and hoping that the wolves would move into the right position. Now is that pretty typical of your wildlife photography that you're you're in a position and you're just waiting for the wildlife to come to where you are um, and, and how do you scout that? Is there, uh, is there a stream or a watering hole or something that you know that they're going to come to you or is it it's just luck? It's You can do uh, a lot of research uh, into the, the species to start with. Um, then obviously you get to the location and scout the location. One of the first things you'll be considering is where is the light going to be at a particular time of day. Most wildlife is active first thing in the morning and maybe towards dusk. In the middle part of the day animals go to ground. It doesn't matter whether you're photographing in the northern hemisphere, bears, wolves in a forest, or whether you're in the open savannah in East Africa photographing lions and, and zebra. The other thing you have to consider is something known as the uh, circle of fear. Uh, every animal, including us, we have one, um, whereby you can't get too close because an animal will uh, perceive that there is a threat, it's, something's changed in its environment, uh, and therefore you need to be aware of that. Some animals are more tolerant than others, uh, and of course, depending on the specifics of the location, indeed, some animals may even be semi-habituated to human presence, certainly the presence of vehicles. They see the whole entity as, as one thing. 
Uh, they don't sort of pick out individual faces. So let's talk a little bit about faces, specifically some of the portraits that you've taken. You know, I've looked at your, your uh, portfolio and you have wildlife photography from all over the uh, world. Uh, and then we have this portfolio about India and it's almost all human faces. So why did you choose to shoot uh, portraits in India as opposed to wildlife? Well, that particular portfolio grew out of a project I became involved with. Um, it's a UK based uh, health charity uh, that promotes uh, the use of safe injections with uh, syringes. Uh, one of the biggest problems in third world is the transmission of disease through the reuse of uh, hypodermic needles and syringes. And in India it's, it's quite prevalent, uh, 350,000 pe people a year contract diseases such as hepatitis, HIV, through the reuse of syringes. So in the, the portraits that uh, you see in, in that portfolio on my website, uh, they came about as a, as a wider project where I travelled to a number of Indian cities. Um, and India is uh, one of the most remarkable places for photography. It's probably, of, of all the countries I've traveled to, it's the one country where everybody you meet is so accepting of the camera, regardless of who they are. Um, and it's a, just a wonderful place with the vibrant colors combined with that welcoming nature uh, of the people. Um, and uh, you can just make some wonderful pictures. I totally agree with you. It is one of the most amazing places in the world and uh, literally one of my favorite places in the world is northern India. So thank you for sharing those photos with us. Well, let's get back a little bit more to your wildlife photography. One of the things that we get a lot of questions about is just can you give us some basic tips for shooting wildlife? So do you have like maybe three or four tips that you could share with those that are watching today uh, to help them if they're just a beginner or intermediate photographer, some things that they should consider and do when they're shooting wildlife? Yes, for sure. I think probably the most important, and it applies to any discipline of photography, whether you're photographing a portrait of a friend or shooting wildlife, is preparation. You need to do some reading around your subject. Don't be too ambitious. Pick one particular species or maybe two or three species, read around the subject and learn about their behavior. Learn about the sort of things that the, that the creature will do, its habitat, where you're likely to find it. I know it sounds a little uh, teaching people to suck eggs, but it's amazing how that, f those few steps taken out first thing, get the groundwork done, and rather like the pictures in Bavaria of the wolves, you can make your own luck by being prepared and understanding how your subject is likely to behave once it's in front of the camera. Obviously then comes preparation of your equipment, making sure that you've got the right gear to do the job. Obviously if you can get close to your subject, you're not going to need quite as long a lens as maybe a subject that is particularly timid or maybe very small, photographing small birds for instance. So those sort of things, working out position, uh, time of day, the position of the light and what sort of equipment lenses you're going to be needing, they're absolutely key to getting good wildlife photographs. Preparing yourself as well. Um, you need the right sort of equipment and, and, and gear, and clo clothing in particular. Yeah, you don't want anything that has Velcro uh, or you know, um, Ziploc type fastenings. It'll make a noise. Likewise, a lot of um, waterproof clothing these days, it has a, quite a high rustle factor. If you go into a clothing store, the first thing I always do is take a sleeve and rub it together. If it makes a, a rubbing, rustling noise, forget it, it's no good. If you're going to be moving around in a very quiet environment, then that kind of clothing, any kind of zip fastenings and Velcro fastenings that make a noise, you're going to spook your subject. Those are phenomenal tips. It's stuff I would have never thought about. Well, that's, I think, sort of what you're known for is, is giving those uh, instructions that really make a difference to photographers. So can you tell us a little bit more about your, your books and your workshops? Uh, what's new and what's happening uh, as far as your teaching these days? I've just completed books on the, the Nikon D3100 and the Nikon D7000. And I'm already started work on the very latest Nikon DSLR, the uh, Nikon D5100. Um, in terms of teaching, I do some online courses uh, at betterphoto.com. Uh, and I do practical workshops here in the UK. Um, at the moment, I'm doing a series for the Nikon dealer Greys of Westminster, uh, which in involves both practical workshops and also seminars, presentations, which I give in London and around some areas in, in the south of England. Well, that's wonderful. So we're out of time today, Simon, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dee, Mark. 
Absolutely. Well, again, you can see Simon's work at simonstafford.co.uk or just look at the Adorama Learning Center for more about Simon's workshops, books, and uh, the things that he's done. Well, don't forget to subscribe to Adorama TV. Check out more articles, tips and tricks, and other videos at the Adorama Learning Center and follow me on Twitter. And as always, if you have suggestions for guests on how they do that, you can send them to me at askmark at adorama.com. Thanks again for joining us. This episode is brought to you by Adorama TV. Visit the Adorama Learning Center where you'll find photography tips and techniques, links to the gear used in this episode, and related videos. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit adorama.com. And the next time you're in New York City, visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue.